Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to the GEAR talk this evening. Um, welcome to those of you who've come from outside. There's lots of familiar faces who've come from outside. And um, this evening, I'd like to welcome Richard Montjoy, who's going to um, uh, give us a talk. Richard uh, graduated with his BSc from here at WITS um, uh, a number of years ago. And he uh, decided to come back and do an MSc by coursework and research report. And he's just finished that, so he's hoping to graduate with an MSc the next time we walk across the stage. So Richard now works for um, uh, Ambono Capital as a project manager. And he um, has worked on a number of exploration programs in South Africa and Northern Canada, including um, things like nickel uh, PGE, diamonds, coal, coal bed methane, and gold exploration and mining projects. And he tries to provide sound geoscientific input in development planning to ensure effective data acquisition, management, and project execution for all aspects of mining. So um, I'd like to thank, as ever, um, John Hancock from CCIC for providing the drinks and the chips. Thank you, John. And uh, we look forward to um, uh, Richard's talk today, the title of which is on the screen. So thanks, Rich. This one? Is that good? Excellent. Um, guys, thanks, thanks so much, Judith, and always good to be back. Um, I feel like I'm preaching a little bit to the converter here because some of you may have heard a lot of this before. But anyway, um, I'd also just like to, this, this effectively forms my submission for my uh, dissertation for, the, uh, for my MSc. And um, just some of the uh, people that contributed towards this was, was Paul, um, Paul Nix, Jamie Price of uh, Cardiff University, uh, Ines Beerman, my colleague, did some uh, um, petrographical work on Maseko for his, uh, his honours project, and uh, Keith Mathieu who was uh, working for MSA at the time, did some really sound uh, exploration work and laid the basis for the project. So uh, really, it's, it's, it's quite a neat story, and it just, it, it just uh, it really talks to a systematic exploration program that has resulted in the, uh, say, def a discovery, but more about the definition of a, of a world-class platinum asset. So I just want to tell you that story, and um, hopefully it, it makes sense. So... First of all, there's, uh, there's Lesecho um, on the uh, northeastern sector of the uh, northwestern sector of the eastern limb. So I don't need to tell you guys about the bushfire complex. There's people here who are way more qualified than me who could tell you about it. So we'll just pop onto the next slide. So exactly where, where the project is. Um, there it is there. Uh, let's get used to this thing. Anyway, uh, you can see where it is there. So just to the north of us, we've got uh, Anorax or Baconi's uh, platinum mine over there. Um, going along Strike, uh, Anglo Platinum's uh, Twickenham project. Uh, going down to Marula. I haven't bothered putting the projects on further south. And of course, to the, uh, to the west of us, we've got uh, Lonman's Limpopo mine. So it's a, pretty good, it's a pretty good area to be in. And as you can see from that... Uh, Really nice, nice grades, um, you know, nice grades and, and significant resources. Now the question is, why would you go look down dip of, uh, you know, that's, that's Lacerco is quite about 20 kilometers down dip of, uh, of the Coney mine. So you would expect that to be quite deep. So what is the exploration rationale for going to look down there? So really what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is the interaction and relationship between the bushfire complex and the, uh, and the foot wall rocks. Now these um, have been quite well defined or quite well studied since about 1978 by Button. And uh, there's some various papers, Yukon and Watkeys, uh, uh, that have listed on the uh, right hand side there. And you know, they, they go into quite a bit of detail about the relationship and the emplacement of these, uh, uh, of the relationship of the bushveld with the floor rocks. So this map here, after Yukon and Watkeys, uh, we can just want to highlight a couple of points. So you can see the Hapsburg zone over there. Let's 
talking into you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we've got the uh, cut cloth over here, uh, the swear and fold over there, uh, the Malopi dome over here, the Pani dome over there, and uh, what's not shown on this map is uh, the Burgersville bulge and various domes associated with that. So, if you have a look at. I beg your pardon, Reese? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, the, the Seiko is on the Fasiri dome over here. So, I'll get to that in a, in a second. <coughs> It's not, it's, it's Lesirco, it was also known, Fasiri Dome is also known as the Zyklerf Dome. Zy, yeah, Zyklerf and Fasiri Dome. There are no other names for it that I can think of. So, this is, uh, this is quite a neat image. You can see, uh, obviously this is a Google Earth, just a sort of plain uh, satellite image. You can see there's the uh, Fasiri Dome over there. Um, so let's look at the screen here. There's the Cutcliff Dome over there interacting with the football rocks there. Uh, there's the swear and fold over there. And uh, you can see the uh, Malopi dome over here and the Papani dome over there. So it's, it's quite clear on this image. I mean, you can clearly see the difference between the Transvaal supergroup rocks and the Bushvalt rocks, which give a much more rugged uh, appearance over there. So that, of course, is the uh, main zone rocks, main zone, uh, subzone B rocks f forming the Lulu Mountains. That's uh, Bacconi Mine over there, or Atok. That's Messina Platinum over there. And then, of course, you've got the uh, critical zone basically outcropping there and, and coming down through there. And you can see all the workings related to the uh, um, platinum and, uh, and chromatite mines. So there you go. That sort of highlights all the uh, um, footwall interactions of, of significance in the area. So why are these important? Well, again, these people better qualified to talk about this than me, but uh, Gilia et al. 2003 did some, uh, did some modeling, and you can see the emplacement of the dome uh, of, of football rocks uh, of Tory group sediments into the Rustenburg layered suite. And so she did some numerical modeling, and you can see how these domes in place over time. Um, Luke, uh, Luke Longridge and uh, Roger Gibson did uh, some good work on the uh, swear and fold. And uh, so that's from there, from Luke's 2009 paper. And I've just sort of estimated a cross section across the swear and fold over there. There it goes across there. So uh, from the northwest down to the southeast. Note the asymmetrical arrangements of the dome. And I think that's, that's important that uh, um, Guya et al. sort of, you know, they just modeled a, a sort of stock standard uh, diaper in placing, just, and it's, it looks pretty symmetrical in the modeling. Um, of course, the work that uh, Luke and uh, Roger did shows some nice asymmetry, and I think that's, that, that's quite common across these domes. You know, nature doesn't behave in a nice symmetrical way. Um, of course, what I haven't said yet is that these domes are obviously related to uh, pre existing uh, topographical highs, and um, you've basically got an uh, influx of, uh, of heat into these uh, football sediments, um, a density contrast. You get uh, ductile deformation and really a positive feedback. You get an increased uh, surface area exposed to these, uh, exposed to these um, explosive magnets, so an increased heat flow, and it just gets more and more ductile, and you kind of get a runaway system forming these domes. So, and several, uh, several kilometers worth of displacement, or thousands of meters. So if we, uh, I'm just going to show you a, uh, a section from surface across that southwest northeast line there that I've, that I've drawn. Um, so basically looking from the R37, from the highway, next to the Cutcliffe Dome. And it's, it's quite neat. Um, so, so behind us is the Cutcliffe Dome, and we're looking north to the northeast. There's, uh, that's the, those are lower zone rocks over there, classic... Uh, um, classic uh, field stop, field trip stuff. Uh, you've got the critical zone. There's the Cody mine over there, uh, just sort of in the, in the background there. Then um, the subzone A of the main zone forms this topic, and, and the lower and the critical zone forms this uh, these sort of flat uh, flat plains. And then really the subzone B forms the Lulu Mountains over here, this area there. And you can actually see the regional dip. 
not too clear in this photograph, but certainly on these rocks in the foreground here, you can see the regional dip dipping to the, uh, um, to the southwest, as you would expect, certainly to the south. This uh, image carries on across onto the next line over here. Um, and you can see the regional dip in this area has actually changed. So it's not very clear from this image, but uh, certainly if you're standing on the side of the road, you, you, you can definitely see it. Uh, the regional dip has changed. So you can kind of see a very large synclinal structure dipping down and coming up again. And you'll notice the, the uh, look at the appearance of these rocks, very rugged as you saw in the Google Earth image. And where we get to the Seri Dome, you can clearly see these are Transvaal sediments and, that's, and that change in dip. So this gave the guys uh, early on in the, in the 80s really the idea that, uh, that, that there might be a reef dragged close to surface. So pre-1982, Angler Vol drilled a hole on the farm Yesterecht. So here, here is the Faseri Dome. You can see it's got a very distinct structure over there. Um, that is the uh, Vornikop, and sorry, that's the Vornikop and the Stoffport faults coming down there. Very large displacement. Uh, in green, we've got uh, um, that's the uh, upper zone. Uh, that darker green is the main zone, and uh, again, that's the upper zone over there. And the much darker green over there is the critical zone. So, Angerval drilled this hole uh, in uh, 1982. Intersecting Marensky Reef at 2,100 meters and UG2 at uh, 2.5 uh, kilometers depth. And they got quite good grades from that. Um, Gentlemen uh, sunk a couple of holes, um, both on the uh, eastern and the, uh, and the, sorry, on the eastern flanks and on the southern flanks. So the bulk of the drilling done over there. Now it was significant because uh, there are actually uh, critical zone rocks outcropping on the, uh, on the southern flank of the dome. But you'll see there's, there's a bit of a space problem. So Trodex uh, explored from 89 to uh, 94, and then BHP stepped in uh, from 95 to 97, and the guys did quite a bit of exploration. And this image on the, on the left is a cross-section uh, from uh, south to north over there. Uh, and you can see, I just want to highlight some things. You can, see that, you can see that unconformity over there between the upper zone, the main zone, and the critical zone, and have even got gone into lower zone rocks there, and that's of course is the uh, got the Pretoria group or the meta sediments over there, so the side of the dome. And they've they've modelled this as, as as very steeply dipping over there, so that's very well documented in uh, Schoon's Roger Schoon's paper back in 2002. So we 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 sort of started the project with with this in mind, and uh, as you can see, there's very little uh, information on the on the eastern flank, just these two boreholes. Which, which intersected a highly sheared, um, what they thought was a UG2 in Marensky, almost a remnant of it. Um, just take note where they drilled those holes over there and over there. So that's the project area there, by the way, um, outlined in, 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 in red. So as I say, those German holes, um, that was the one that German drilled over there to the north. Uh, they called it a bastard reef, intersected uh, with Marensky considered absent. Oh, so the Bolsa Reef was intersected. They didn't uh, pick up the Marensky and with highly sheared critical zone lithology. So effectively, it was a dud borehole. Over there, um, they, um, again, it was actually a duplication of, of this hole. Uh, sorry, I haven't put a call out for that, for that hole. Uh, but it was, again, highly sheared um, critical zone lithologies. Not really sure what they were getting. This hole over here stopped, for, stopped short for some reason. Uh, Rob, I think you were drilling on this hole, is that correct? That's true. And they pulled the plug on the budget or something? That's right. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, this is the German hole that uh, got very nice grades uh, down at depth. So, so we knew something was there, but there was a big question mark over what was happening in, in this area. I've put a little smudge of brown on the, on the uh, surface there, and that really is a... Uh, uh, hybridized melt and uh, why it's and there's possibly a window of uh, probably critical zone rocks showing between the football there and this hybridized melt. So we did some aeromagnetics and uh, it's, it's, it's quite, quite neat. I mean you can clearly see the, uh, the uh, 
a Vornicop fault coming through there. Um, it highlighted a couple of uh, a couple of dikes, not too many, um, which is uh, interpreted here in, in white. So Jeff Campbell did this for us, and then some uh, some faults over there. You can see there's the upper zone, uh, a conformably uh, overlaying main zone. You can see the uh, um, the trace of the Tasiri dome. Those mag highs are uh, um, probably related to the uh, um, to the horn falses there. And uh, several uh, several RRAP, uh, RRAP bodies were picked up, and we can pick those up in the field or see at least uh, um, sort of traces of them on surface. The, uh, it also highlighted sort of a, 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 a lack of a paucity of, of faults in the in the project area, which was which was quite neat. Um, we couldn't pick up any faults with any major obvious displacement. So following this, um, we did some soil geochem. And uh, this was quite interesting. Uh, this is uh, chrome, and you can see that there's definitely a chrome high uh, in the soil geochem just adjacent to the dome over there. Um, and you can see it really picks up. We didn't, th that was the last line done over there, and of course, that was off our property, so we didn't bother exploring there, but there's known uh, chrome outcrops in the site. So, and along with some geological mapping, uh, it was quite handy to uh, pick up these. Uh, um, a north site, a north site horizons, and um, they make really neat markers. Upper north site, middle north site, lower north site. Well, we can certainly pick up uh, the upper north site in the main zone. So that was that was quite neat and very handy for predicting your uh, drilling and uh, as controls. We did some trenching um, on. Uh, so those are two trenches there. We did two trenches across the. Uh, um, Across the uh, that that's, uh, across the football contact of the Rustenburg layered suite against the dome, and we actually picked up uh, more sort of pods of uh, of chrome, and the assays from that you can see that they ran at pretty low 0.87 uh, grams a ton from the first trench, and just over one gram a ton from the second trench, so over six, thickness of 67 centimeters and 1.1 uh, meter respectively, so. Nothing really to uh, to write home about, and we couldn't ever prove any continuity, so it was clear that there was nothing really at surface. Um, in parallel to this, uh, we ran quite an extensive seismic program. So you can see there's uh, there are five lines of seismics, largely controlled by topography. So of course it's it's quite rugged terrain in this area. That uh, is uh, subzone B of the main zone. So tricky to get into, so we could just really run these lines where we could. Just take note, we ran these lines right up against the base of the dome, especially lines 5, 1, and 4. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a seismic section of, um, of line uh, 1, so line 5. And you can see as you get close to the dome, these were the modeled reflectors, and we, and we lost them. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't clear... Where the uh, where, where, where the you know what the inter what the relationship between the the Rustenburg layered suite and the Fasiri dome was between the football sediments, so this uh, line in yellow is the um, football contact at least the contact between the Fasiri dome and the uh, and the Rustenburg layered suite. So based on that, we could come up with with a. Uh, um, uh, with an isopack map of the of the uh, of the UG2, the UG2 proved to be quite a nice reflector, and on the back of that we did a bit of drilling. So just out of interest, along those profiles we ran gravity, and this line over here is the uh, is the mapped contact, at least the uh, publicly available contact in the literature, mapped by Yukon, and uh, that arrow over there is the model contact based on density of the Rustenburg layer suite from the gravity. So it would seem that the, that the football contact was actually sitting a couple of hundred meters into uh, at least um, about 100 or so meters further uh, east. So that, that was interesting. So we're starting to gain a bit, of, a bit more data now about the, the relationship between the dome and the Rustenburg layer suite. So we did some exploration drilling. Uh, we started drilling out in the uh, on the seismic lines, 
once we're confident, we put out a, a grid and started drilling the hills. And along this section, where we, we had the most information in the shallow center section, we stepped forward into the dome. Now I must emphasize, we didn't start drilling against the flanks of the dome to try to obtain reef and try to duplicate what Jenman did those years back. We bit the bullet, started deep, really stepped off from, from that Jenman hole that was uh, drilled all the way down there, and based on the seismics, uh, drilled in this area. We were then traced the reef up, and along this, this is a section along that section line A, B there, we were successful in tracing the reef up, and you can see how we splayed these drill holes out, quite shallow, and getting the reef up to about 300, uh, 350 meters close to surface. That, by the way, is our, uh, is our trench, trenching data over there. So it was starting to come together now. We then stepped off and went north and south, and very quickly we lost the reef. So I just want to highlight one thing over here. You can see we've almost got a bit of a synclinal structure on the dome coming there. Look at the amount of space that you've got in this area as opposed to the amount of space that you've got in this area and in this area. You're losing several hundred meters. And, and due to the sort of the anticline coming out here, you're also losing space in this area. So really, in hindsight, this is the area that provides the most space to accommodate the emplacement of the Rustenberg layered suite. It's going to be dragged up by the dome. So, after the drilling, um, we, uh, we, we could quite confidently model the, the reef geometry. So, this is a, uh, these are wireframes showing the, the, the dip of the reef. So, you can see very close to the dome, in that area there, we've got dips between uh, 72 and 80 degrees, almost sub vertical. And these quite quickly shallow out, so that's the 1,200 meters below collar uh, depth. And uh, what was remarkable was the, 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 how quickly the, the reef shallowed out. The deflection point was actually quite sharp. And we think that's what threw the seismics. You didn't see a gradual change in the seismics. It just, it just deflected and boom, you just lost the seismics because we weren't, we, weren't, we weren't sort of expecting to see a, a nice gradual drag up. And we see the exact same for the UG2 on the, on the left here, just about 200, 250 meters deeper. So you can see a very sharp inflection point over there. So that's, that's pretty unique to, uh, uh, to the bushveld as, as far as we're aware. And that's, that's interesting. It brings in some interesting, uh, some interesting mining challenges um, uh, both, and some interesting opportunities as well. So you can see that once you get down to about uh, 14, uh, 1200 down to 1400 meters, it just dips, you know, changes to a relatively constant dip of about uh, 10 or 12 degrees. And uh, you can see it's really flattening out there. So the idea, this would be much more conventional what you would expect our, our platinum mines to look like. And this, if you guys are familiar with uh, the old Messina platinum mine or Longman's Limpopo, where they've got very steeply dipping reef at about uh, 70 degrees, uh, that sort of mirrors that. So it's quite interesting. We've got a project that mirrors two different mining domains. And that's obviously standard goes for the UG2 as well. So you can clearly see the effect of the dome on the uh, grade distribution. And so let me just also say that we have drilled there, you know, sort of a long strike there and a long strike there. But the reef was so sheared and anomalous and, and uh, just poor quality, if at all present. And the, the, clearly the effect of the dome on the, on the reef uh, it's just sort of overwhelmed the formation of the reef. We've, we've cut, it out the, cut it out the wireframe and cut it out the modeling, so we haven't even bothered to, to include that. So that really, those are the, 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 the model boundaries of our resource. Um, note how the grade dips off. This is Marensky 4E grade. How the grade dips off as you get shallower and get closer to the dome. So clearly the dome is having an impact on the, uh, on the formation of the Marensky reef. Uh, we're looking at... Uh, uh, 4E grade copper and nickel, and again we see a very similar story with the uh, with the UG2. So grade just dropping off there. Um, let's just talk about the uh, the, the, the reef fasces that we get. Um, the Marinsky reef fasci is very similar to what you get both at at Lonman and at uh, um, and at Bacconi. So. We're seeing uh, two little uh, chromatized stringers, two little leaders there, and the, the, the grade is uh, um, 
clearly associated with those chromatized stringers. These are typically about 20 centimeters apart. Uh, we get into a, a pegmatoidal falsbatic peroxinate, also about 20 to uh, 40 centimeters thick, uh, into peroxinate. Sometimes you get a second pegmatoidal falsbatic peroxinate uh, with another grade kick, and this, this may vary in, uh, from a few centimeters to a couple of meters into the going down. So quite a thick, uh, thick peroxinate package hosted in a, in a noritic package. So again, the Marensky Reef is a grade cut in this, in this case. Uh, it's not a lithological cut, so you've got your grade control needs to be quite tight. Um, on your UG2, uh, again, very similar to what you get at, uh, at Messina Platinum. Uh, we've got two fasces. We've got what we call a single reef fasces. So it's uh, your chromatite uh, with a thin leader right at the top. This is a couple of meters. You've got your leaders uh, sitting about 20, 30 centimeters above your uh, main chromatite layer. Your main chromatite with a uh, uh, pigmentoidal falsbatic peroxinite uh, footwall, or, um, and then, uh, then again a peroxinite footwall, and sometimes it'll chrome, chrome uh, stringer right at the base of this. We do see a, a split, what we call a split reef fasces, um, uh, where uh, we've got a little peroxinite parting within the UG2. Interesting enough, the, uh, the, the platinum palladium ratio profile through this. Uh, mirrors this, and this is probably just the uh, chrom as, as these probably consist of two separate chromatite layers that are just sitting on top of each other. Um, and that is the uh, interesting enough also where we've got the split reef fasces, the leaders move up several meters into the hanging wall. And again, this poses uh, um, mining challenges from a geotechnical point of view, so that needs to be taken into account in the mine design. Is that me? Oh. Okay. Um, just this map on the uh, this map on the right hand side here. That's a map of the uh, wh where the split tree fasces occurs. Uh, so it's really held up in the north there. That's just a, a function of the contouring with the with the, with the data point with the drill holes. And there's a little bit of it, but generally the whole deposit is is uh, as a parting of about 20 centimeters. So you would just take the whole uh, you would just take the whole thing out. So this is quite neat. Um, on, on the boreholes that, uh, that we intersected close to the hanging wall, uh, so close to the Siri Dome, um, it's actually clearly evident that the strain uh, was taken up. Uh, you can see how the strain has been taken up in the hanging wall in these uh, Motel de North sites. So here's the, uh, here's the Marensky Reef over here. Uh, this is at a depth of 700 meters. And uh, look at these... Uh, Look at these mottled anorthosites and spotted anorthosites. You can clearly see a fabric. Uh oh. I broke it. Um, I'll just uh, restart the program. Oh. Okay. Uh, anyway, so you can clearly see the fabric on the, uh, on the hanging wall there. Um, it, I'm not, you know, we couldn't identify, we haven't done any detailed mineralogy, we couldn't identify a strain taken up in the, uh, we couldn't identify a strain taken up in the Marensky itself, um, so that's interesting, but I'm not sure if it's, if it's but there's definitely duct hole deformation going on in the, in the hanging wall in the north sites. Okay, so uh, after all of that, we ended up with quite a nice resource, um, just under six grams a ton. Seem happy again. No, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, and a uh, very nice uh, nickel grade of 0.2%, um, copper grade of 0.09%, 204 million tons, uh, which equates to 39 million ounces. So it's a, it's, it's a really nice uh, resource to have uh, proved up in the area at a relatively shallow depth. So just how does it stack up against, uh, against mines in the... Uh, in, in, in on the bush belt. There it is there in red. You can see nice high grade, uh, a decent uh, a resource, resource. so uh, it's, it's definitely worth writing home about. Uh, the Marensky Reef, due to the uh, high nickel content, it's got a uh, very nice uh, basket price. This isn't just February, February numbers. So uh, uh, there it is there on uh, about six from the right. On the Marensky, so it's, it's quite an attractive, uh, quite an attractive project, and um, it's just under the word price there on the uh, on the UG two there. Uh, 
so it doesn't, you can see the UG2 doesn't quite have the value proposition that Marensky has. So when you mine it, it certainly makes sense to pull out as much Marensky as possible. So uh, conclusions. Um, so the discovery and resulting definition of the resource in the CEFO project uh, resulted from a systematic phased exploration program testing conceptual exploration model uh, based on SIN bush belts and placement of the dome. So just by going through the motion, stepping through in a, in a nice systematic, not just jumping straight to drilling, we were able to develop a, a, a good exploration program um, resulting in, in a successful resource definition. So the structural setting of the deposit is unique, we believe, uh, given a sub-vertical dips the reef near surface, um, which shallow out with increasing depth. So I mentioned this before, the loss of seismic reflectors in close proximity to the dome, where the reefs are less than 1,200 meters depth, was probably due to the steep dip and a relatively sharp inflection point. So we just would have, you know, how these seismics work with your uh, reflectors just bounce off and you've got to pick them up somewhere else. So if you're not expecting that angle, you're not going to pick them up on your on your geophones. Uh, so this has important implications for exploration strategies around other possible events we needed to reef dome associated targets in the bush belt. We saw that there are several domes. We know that th these domes exist in the bush belt. Um, so if you're going to go explore around them, how do, you, how do you go about doing it? So I would argue that in order to increase the chance of success, a counterintuitive strategy of starting exploration away from the immediate vicinity of the dome. Uh, should be adopted in order to understand the undisturbed stratigraphy through a process of mapping, seismics, and subsequent drilling. So in other words, you step away, understand what you've got in the undisturbed lithologies, because if you start poking around in these disturbed lithologies, you very quickly get yourself confused. It's a, it's a difficult and possibly more expensive approach to take, but it pro probably will save you in the long run. Um, yeah, so once this is better understood, the exploration program can move from the known stratigraphy into the unknown disturbed horizons closer to the dome. So that's it from me. I think we're done fairly quickly. Um, It's a good, good, good question, and I th maybe I haven't clearly covered it in this talk. But what we, I think we were, we were possibly expecting a mimic of what they got on the uh, um, on the southern flank of the dome. So, so of course, that image on the on the right hand side is is over here. So, uh, so by poking around, you know, we were we were, I think, sort of expecting to get. We'd, we'd really just understand the relationship, but we expect to get to get something similar to that, um, possibly even steeper dipping. And all the information we had to go on was the was the German boreholes that um, were sheared. So, and then with the loss of the seismics near the dome, we actually thought that there was nothing there. There was a bit of granite on on surface, or uh, called it hybrid melt, yeah. and we actually thought that the whole area was just hybrid melt and had it just obliterated the uh, the remains of. Um, uh, of the Rustenberg Layer Suite. So you thought it's not there? We thought it wasn't there. So it was a pleasant surprise when we when we stepped off what we knew and stepped off the, the known reflectors and it started tracing it up closer to the dome. May I ask one question as well mm. as on this slide? So that is there any change in this picture or it is is that drifting this picture alive or that kind of a strong uh, discordance between upper dome and that's or you 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 have been not working this area? No, so so we haven't. Th this is off on this area, that that red line. Okay, there. So, you're not there. so we yeah. haven't we haven't done any work over there, and I don't think that a couple of other companies have picked up the ground, um, but I don't think that they've up done any work there either. So we we stepped here with the with the grave and that that side were weren't very good. Okay, thanks. And yeah. Okay, Grant. From a magma emplacement placement uh, perspective, I was really interested. Zone. Does 
say something about the timing of replacement and is that expected in the time scale of dome formation? And that, that suggests something really interesting about the yeah. like replacement yeah. time scale. Yeah. I don't know how long it takes these domes to form, but it suggests that the upper dome is replaced after dome formation. Um, so I think Roger can confirm on Luke's paper, but I think it's about 600,000 years for the pavement of the sphere and dome. I'd like to refer to the silent third one. And Paul. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Paul. Paul's author, Jay. Is this the Jay? So he's a... Uh, <laughs> he does. But, but does that place a time constraint on the uh, timing between the main zone and the upper zone? 600,000 years? Because that's a really important for bushveld replacement models. Um, well, we certainly know from elsewhere in the bushveld complex that there's an unconformity between the upper zone and the main zone. Mm. So that's not new. What seems to be picked up here is that it's showing something, suggesting the timing of the dome formation. So the, the upper zone, not the domes. The upper zone, not the domes. It must be. Yeah. Yeah. If, if there's an exposure of upper zone, yeah. upper zone in the northern part of the diagram on the left-hand side, um, you might get the impression from the diagram on the right that the unconformity between the main zone and the upper zone is related to dome formation. That's not the case. We're very passionate
We definitely see, uh, so just to comment on the, on the deformation we take of the north site, it's clearly obvious in the north site. I'm not saying it's possibly not take, you know, because you've got these nice big crystals, you can see them being smeared out in that. You know, maybe in the Marinsky, it's a, a, so you haven't sort of looked at it under a microscope or anything like that. Um, so your, que your second question, your second point was? Well, I'm wondering, is it, has it, has it, has oh, it's a thinning, yeah. Oh, for sure, sorry, for sure. I don't know if there's a space problem if you put it back. There's certainly, you, you, you can certainly see the, the effects of the dome on the, you know, on, on, on marker horizons as you get close to the dome. So you get shallower, your Marinsky, and you sort of, and you lose your, um, uh, you just lose your, your, your nice, uh, you know, you, you just lose your nice stratigraphy. And you don't see your chromatites forming anymore, the gray drops off. So clearly the, the reef formation processes are being somehow disturbed. By, by the dome. If it's form after, then it should be the gas deformant, that's it. So the Venensky the, the didn't know about the dome, I guess, at the no, time of the mesh. It had to be still hot. It's sin, sin emplacement. Yeah. Are you saying that they were together through crystallization? But then, then that would be the primary position of the drawing. No, I, no, because no, so it, it wouldn't have dragged it up. If it was flatter than before, then Menesky doesn't should care about that that the door. Can you come if back the door was there to then <laughs> then, okay, so yeah, just interesting. Okay. Um Roger has one comment and a low back. I just want to be corrected. Richard used the inappropriate word there. He, he said the Marinsky processes were affected. No. I agree with Grace, the Marinsky must have come in. The dome wouldn't have been affected. Or it wouldn't have been affected in the Marinsky. Rotations happen after Marinsky crystallization and cold enough. And I think it's if, if you actually did the uh, did the sun there and tracked out the lens, you would see. It would be interesting to know if you were on the other side of the, the sag, so you, if you were outside the sag that would be created by this dome coming up, whether your Marinsky is thicker and your duty two is thicker and your whole package is thicker, and it starts to thin as you go into the sag. Because the sag is created by increasing the length as the mm. sea drags up. So your Marinsky should be thinner in the least area. Um, as should the unit, the whole package should actually be slightly compressed. And it'd be easy enough to ask you actually calculate how much extension and thinning should have occurred. So why wouldn't you get sorry, can I just ask Roger a question? So why answer questions, so. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, you, you say that the the, 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 the the reformation process weren't working. Oh so they 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 already they, 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 they happened. But then how come you don't see the remnants of, of those of, of the of the lithologies, like you don't get the uh, the little Marinsky pegmatoid sitting in the center there. It's just a it's just a flat peroxide. Oh, that's it, yes. I don't care about that. So you know, so yeah, I mean, the, the second thing you've got to consider is that as part of this process, you, the, the, the the floor rocks are melting. Now, I'd like to talk later about this this hybrid as well. Mm. So you must have a chemical effect as mm. well as a structural mm. effect occurring. In Yeah, we've done, we've actually done a hell of a lot of work on that. Uh, sorry, I excluded that from this talk, but uh, happy to. So the question is, is there a mine plan being um, created yet? I can give you a quick overview, a 30 second overview if you like. Sure. So on, on the steeper sections, basically you mine it using a mechanized mining method, doing a, what's a sub-level open stoping. So you put a tunnel in along the reef, drill up, blast the whole thing down, and then on the, on Below, basically, where the reef dips about 35 degrees and lower, you mine it conventional, how they typically mine on a uh, South African bush belt mine or platinum Marinsky UG2. Rob, do you have a quick Right. 
So, so Rob, was that was that an assignment thing? Because this is where the no, 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 no. Oh, they actually took part of the program, yeah. Yeah, that's very true. And then was the we um looking you see we looked at this geology and thought, no, that's that's not really what it's true. Because when you look at what you've got on that right now, the panel is there. Um you know, we we just didn't see that as being available for Right next to the river there, it's nice flat and uh yeah. so that's that's where we drew the ball. Uh we went down five hundred meters, the funds ran out, and unfortunately <coughs> well we got Martin Sharp in to give us some advice because he was part of the Bush Belt Research Institute which is part funded by Angela Bars when he came and took us to school and, and said no. What basis was it the wrong sort of? I mean, you 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 had you had picked up the uh, at a north south horizon. I think it's the upper model north or south mm -hmm. in, in, in yellow, and you know the, the stratigraphy was was there that you could identify as upper model north well, south.